Ralby flew in way ahead of time um, to do all the casting. So we, we did scanning of his face and casting and more mouth casting. And, and, and we did our very first test with him two weeks later. And, and that was great, but the wigs weren't ready then. So I mocked up some wigs. I got some ones that were already made and, and you know, dressed them as close as I could to what I thought uh, my, my wigs would end up looking like. And um, so we did our very first test then, and we must have tested at least uh, two or three other times more. Again, honing in very, you know, we didn't quite get the nose right the first time, and then the second time we got it spot on. Uh, and then it was the whole process of the teeth, which we continued to do, uh, just changing the millimetre, you know, millimetre up closer. And and although I wanted them to be there, they are, they are considerably smaller than the real Freddie Mercury teeth. <laughs> I didn't want a lot. Of stuff. I mean, obviously, we needed the teeth, um, uh, and in fact, he'd been practicing with a set of teeth, so I knew he was completely up for everything, which was great. But um, I just, I mean, the, I approach things. It's, it's kind of the what's the smallest thing I can do that will have the biggest impact. And we did, you know, Mark and I talked about giving him cheek pieces, you know, because his cheek bones weren't quite as prominent as Freddie's. But we decided that for what it was, it, it wasn't going to do enough for us. But most definitely we knew that he needed to change the shape of his nose. And, and in fact, it did so much for us. Um, because in sort of building up this section here of the nose, it helped to bring Rami's eyes closer together because he's a, his eyes are much wider and, and larger than Freddie Mercury's. And also it, it gave us that lovely strong line. Of course the rest of the band members, um, they were also going to have tons of wigs. And, and the thing is, is Queen, you know, it is so easy to get any referencing on Queen. I mean, the, the thing about makeup, um, uh, production design always starts before, uh, so they have loads of referencing. Um, and then costume designer will come in, and, and usually third in is makeup. So there's usually quite a lot of stuff around on a film. Um, uh, but there are documentaries, there was, um, you know, obviously live performances. I mean, you know, the, the whole band Queen, um, was, you know, and obviously because we were going to end it with Live Aid, in fact, Live Aid bookended the film, which was great. Um, so much stuff, so much out there, and, and I just absorbed it. Because um, we were doing that 15-year gap, I wanted to show the difference between when they were very fresh-faced and, and 19, 20, 21, to, to, to when they were 15 years older at Live Aid. So, in fact, we did, I did get their faces cast, and um, uh, Mark Coulier made some very fine lines on, on bondos, uh, which is a, a material that you can, it's almost, you know, you just, it's sticky, so you can almost just apply it direct, or you do apply it direct. Um, and we had sort of little nose to mouth lines made, little aging bits here, uh, little eye bags um, uh, for Ben. I mean, I have worked on projects that had obviously a lot of re recording, working on Gravity and Everest, things where basically the production. Uh, recordings weren't were for the most part unusable in the film so they did need to be re-recorded but this obviously had the extra element working with the vocals it's it's the musicality of making sure that so I, I can fit the vocals into the mouth but then it also still needs to sound musical so it's it's basically taking on uh, those aspects as well which is I just found absolutely fascinating to be honest and it was it was a great challenge but it was very satisfying when it worked I've worked on other concert films before and I know that when you take the recordings that have been recorded from the concert and if you try to turn up the crowd, um, it actually, all you get is more of the kind of the slap of the, the reverb in those microphones. So I, I knew it was going to be uh, quite a key thing uh, to be able to get the, the sound of the, of the Live Aid crowd. Um, we wanted to get them separate, completely clean. Uh, that we saw on the schedule that there was a second unit shoot day when they had 600 extras on to do all the sort of crane shots and close-ups of the crowd. So I asked the line producer if it would be possible to um, record the crowd singing um, on, on this day. And he, he, he said it'd be fine as long as I did it between camera setups. Because obviously those days are very um, sort of pressured for time. Um, so uh, we, we 
recorded that crowd down um, using a kind of a call and response technique, slightly inspired by Freddie's uh, Live Aid performance when he does his deos and the, the crowd all say, say the same thing back that he's just said to them. So we created these sessions where we played back a line to the crowd and they then sang that line back so we could record it clean. Um, and we always sort of discussed about how it, we would need to have the sort of bigger size of the crowd and then the more immediate size of the crowd, the more sort of crowd around you. And then we'd also need to get all the individuals. This is something myself and Nina discussed a lot. Um, so we, we got the, the larger crowd um, at, on, on the Live Aid shoot, but then Nina got the, uh, the medium crowd and the individuals um, in exterior space at Shepparton and um, in, in an ADR theatre for the individuals. One of the first things that happened when uh, the band were, were, were involved and fully supportive of the film, uh, uh, I was invited to go to their studio to have a listen through to some of their archive material and uh, see what we could use for the film. And obviously they have a huge archive and then uh, they came up to Abbey Road one day uh, to when we were doing some, some sort of recording and Brian came up to explain to us about how he'd uh, created the song We Will Rock You. And so he brought his guitar with him and we recorded down uh, him playing the guitar and him explaining to him. I remember thinking to myself that um, uh, I'm at Abbey Road Studios recording Brian May from Queen and uh, this was, uh, again, if I could have got, told my 15 year old self that this was going to happen then uh, that would have been incredibly impressive. Brian came to Abbey Road and he explained to us exactly how that song happened and, and the, the way that song happened is how it's, how it's done in the film. The, the, they wanted to create this, this song for, for their audience. They, they realised that the audience wanted to join in so he wanted to make, give them their own song. And that's, that's how he came, came up with We Will Rock You. When you've got those words before a movie based on a true story, um, you've essentially established a contract with the audience that what they're going to see is pretty much um, true. Now, then you have to start defining the word true, something that happened to a character when they're 50 and you're only dealing with a month in their life, you might want to bring it in and introduce it. Why? Because it's central to that character. Did it happen on that day as you've depicted it? No. Is it true? Yeah, it is. It's true on another level. Um, so in, in the case of uh, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, the, the, the struggle with that was to find an antagonist. Here's a young guy, um, Indian Parsi, born, uh, raised in Zanzibar, ends up in Feltham, a big dreamer, big buck teeth, not an especially great voice. The battle had to be with himself, and that was the realisation that the antagonist... Um, the force of opposition, the obstacle in Freddie's life was himself. Um, and that unlocked that whole movie.